All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation on selective control, ILM 310-305F, the last module in process controls. Selective control, for those of you who have never seen it, involves a selection of one or more signals to control the process or the final control element. Switching between signals can be easily and smoothly accomplished using selective devices called signal selectors. So fairly straightforward. So here's a quick little image that shows us the scenario that we have here. We have a couple of different measuring devices, as you see, controlling the same manipulated variable. And the idea behind this, I guess there's several ideas uh, behind this. The first one is uh, redundancy is a good application for selective control where you'd have two transmitters measuring the exact same uh, property and if one were to fail, then a selective strategy would be able to automatically switch over to the operating device. Um, but it is more involved in that. Um, lots of times we can have selective control um, that will select from a couple of different conditions that may occur as a process is operating in order uh, to try to avoid any unfortunate incidents where, uh, and the way it does it is selective control, we'll use one measuring device for normal situations. And when that device finds itself in uh, an extraordinary circumstance, we can use a selective control strategy to select the other measuring device in order to control the process to avoid any unfortunate situations. And that's kind of a long and short of selective control. So signal selectors choose from among two or more signals. Control loop containing this type of logic is called selective control. So our objectives today are going to be describing the advantages and applications of selective control, which we almost covered already. Uh, explain how we prevent reset windup on selective control. And we've heard that phrase a few times uh, in third year process, and it's a very important one to understand. Uh, so we will be back out of that during this lecture here. Um, objective three, describing methods for tuning selective control systems. I don't recall there being very much in the ILM on that. And then finally, as with most of these ILMs, uh, becoming familiar with a block diagram of a selective control system and being able to uh, draw one out if you had to. So first uh, objective here, describing an advantages and applications. So here we have some selectors just to get us going. Uh, the three ones that we discuss uh, mostly anyway um, in this ILM, uh, a high select, uh, selecting relay image A here with the greater than uh, symbol will select the greater of two inputs. So if I had 50% uh, coming in on X1 and 60% coming in on X2, the signal going out would be the greater of the two signals or 60%. The second type of selector, you know, image B, with the left hand signal is a low selector and surprise, surprise, it selects the lower of the two signals. So again, 50% here, 60% here, our output signal is going to be 50%. The third type of general category here is called the middle or median selector. And you surprise, surprise, uh, it will pick the middle out of the three measurements. So if this is uh, 50 again, uh, X2 was 60 and X3 was 40, uh, it would pick the, the 50, which is in the middle of 40 and 60. So pretty straightforward in, in what they actually do uh, and what their application is. Um, so I hope that uh, doesn't cause too much confusion. Beyond these basic ones, there's a couple of other ones that uh, we do are going to look at here. Uh, the first one here is uh, image A, which is, uh, you see the symbol here, the greater than sign with a line in it, uh, indicates that this is a high limit selector. And a high limit is going to select either the lower of the input or of a high limit value that we program into the selector. So example, if X1 is 80%, uh, the signal coming in is 80%, but we have a high limit 
75 uh, percent, our output will be clamped essentially at 75 percent. Image B shows the same thing, the inverse again, uh, low limit um, selector here, and again the output is the uh, higher of the input or the low limit value. So if X1 is 5% and the low limit is 10%, the output is going to be 10%. So both of these uh, have very defined operations. So a selective control strategy is any strategy where an input in the form of a transmitter is selected over another one based on some type of a situation. Uh, there are a couple of a bunch of generic strategies that we're going to address here. So, uh, auctioneering from multiple inputs is one of the applications. Uh, redundancy to minimize system failure is probably one of the more common applications. Override control to protect people and equipment is another one that we address quite frequently here. Uh, limit controls uh, that are put in place to protect people and equipment. You'll see limit controls quite a bit on uh, furnace type systems. And we'll look at uh, actual process applications uh, to apply these two as well. Uh, and then also the last one here is called variable system structuring for optimizing production. And we'll look at uh, process examples for each of these. <clears throat> so the first one is uh, auctioneering. So here we have a, a reactor bed or a catalyst bed in a reactor type system where we take temperatures uh, across across the bed here. The auctioneering function here takes multiple measurements of the same variable. In this case, it's the temperature of this reactor bed. Uh, and, the, and the idea behind this application is that we don't want any hot spots uh, that will increase the reaction rate faster than we can handle it. So we'll select the temperature transmitter with the highest recorded temperature in order to uh, control the coolant flow. So we can uh, um, select the one that has the, the highest temperature and it will control the valve, uh, this valve down here that controls the cooling water. So there's a couple of different ways that we can do auctioneering just to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, the first process uh, here is if we had, uh, sorry about that, <clears throat> whether we have individual controllers for each temperature transmitter or whether we just have one controller and multiple different transmitters feeding in their information to one different selector. So this is the easier of the two versions, the cheaper of the two versions where we have multiple transmitters on the reactor. And here we have option B where we have multiple different controllers on the reactor. And the essential difference here is that you'll get uh, much more detailed control, I guess, in this type of uh, configuration. In an exchanger application, if they are all fed from the same steam line, for example, but they are all different sizes, we would use an application where we have a different controller on each one because they'd have different tuning parameters for each different uh, exchanger. Redundancy, as I said earlier, is one of the more common applications um, for selective control. In the hostile environments where failure is common or failure could pose imminent danger, redundancy provides multiple transmitters for the same process variable, uh, and one can take over should the other one uh, should the other one fail. So there's an example here where we have two analyzers, um, and if one of them should fail and go low, and again you learn in electronics that you can select the failure action for lots of devices, where the, whether you want it to drive high or whether you want it to drive low, and that'll depend on your process. Um, but in this case, we'll say that the analyzer, should it fail, uh, it's going to drive low and create a low signal, and with the high selector, the selector would automatically then switch to the other analyzer that has uh, the operating proper signal. Uh, in this case here, uh, three analyzers and the middle selector, it's going to take uh, the middle reading out of the three analyzers, and we can say that all three analyzers are operating, and there is some variation between the analyzers. Maybe it's one's high, maybe one's low, uh, one's in the middle, something kind of thing like that. Uh, it will select from the middle one to give what they hope is the uh, most accurate uh, measurement for that situation. <clears throat> 
override control, uh, another one, kind of a safety sort of strategy here where more than one controller manipulates the final control element again, should the operating controller come near to exceeding its constraint. A uh, constraint can be any type of a limit or a situation that we don't want to encounter, um, such as a minimum level. The inactive controller will take over to avoid problems. Um, we call override strategies, uh, sometimes call them constraint strategies. So we'll see uh, what this looks like here. Here we have a surge tank <clears throat> that has no override operation. So basically what happens is if we have our flow coming into the tank and the flow uh, is reduced coming into the tank, eventually the tank is going to empty, causing this pump to cavitate, and that would be a problem. So we need some type of a constraint on here in order to make sure that we have minimum level. So to implement a selective strategy, we can take a low selector, put it in here in the flow loop, and connect it in with the level loop here. And in normal operation, the flow controller is going to be selected by the low selector because its signal uh, is going to generally be lower most of the time. If the level drops to uh, below its uh, set point due to, an, ups uh, due to a, an upset of some kind in the feed, the feed rate, this signal is going to become lower than the flow signal, which is the normal, let's say it's 50%. Uh, this is going to drop down to 25%, and once it does that, it's going to switch control over to the level trans transmitter and the level controller until that level comes back up again. Once the level comes back up again, say 70%, it's going to be higher than the flow controller, and then it will switch back to the flow controller. So the strategy avoids having this tank drain right out and get rid of that problem that we could have with cavitation. So that's what override... Uh, or a constraint type strategy uh, does for us. Here we have a compressor uh, with an override strategy uh, on it as well. We have uh, flow and pressure being uh, measured on the uh, output of the compressor here. And we have, a, again, a low select. Most, almost all applications that we're going to address today, nine out of 10, are going to be low select, wink, wink. Um, the reactor example that we saw earlier, I believe is the only one in the entire ILM that will use a high selector. Just, just interesting tidbit there. <clears throat> so looking at this compressor here in normal operation, the pressure controller is selected by the low, um, by the low selector in order to maintain the pipeline pressure. If the pressure drops, due to some demand, more users coming on downstream, when it gets below the pressure controller set point, the valve is going to open up with the high pressure steam. And what's going to happen is that the turbine is going to cause, uh, is going to be over speeding. It's going to be uh, spinning faster uh, than it can produce the gas. So once that happens, um, that pressure signal is exceeded the the low limit selecting uh, value that we put in for the flow transmitter, it will then be selected. The valve will then close until that pressure rises above the, uh, <clears throat> until the pressure rises above the set point of the pressure transmitter again, at which point it will switch um, from the FT back. It's probably more confusing when I uh, describe this than it is to read. Here's a limit control application. This is a furnace fuel gas uh, example, basically, is what we have here. Uh, and with most furnaces, like the furnaces in our homes, we have pilot lights that stay on all the time. Uh, and industrial furnaces are, lots of them are very similar, where we have a minimum amount of fuel required uh, in order to keep uh, the furnace burning. So limit control is used to prohibit a valve from closing or opening all the way. It's going to stop the controller from going to zero or 100% based on whatever setting we put into it. So in this case, if there is no demand, uh, no demand for hot oil, the controller would want to close our fuel control valve here. And if this happens, then the burner would go out, uh, which is problematic because then you'd have to go through a startup process on your furnace. <clears throat> By having a 5% low limit entered into the controller, 
the valve would only close to 5% minimum and the flame would stay lit. So that's a good example of a low limit control application. Here's the last application where we mentioned variable uh, system structuring here. This is a strategy that uses selectors to restructure uh, a control system in order to optimize resources. Uh, in this case, the resource here is going to be hot oil and how they apply that hot oil to exchangers based on demand. Um, in this application here, the selector is a high selector and it's going to allocate the hot oil to whatever exchanger has the highest call for demand rate for hot oil based uh, on the process variable of temperature. So lots of good applications for selective control. Again, the most common ones are, are probably the safety override uh, versions and the redundant ones. Uh, you'll see a lot of redundancy, especially in larger petrochemical facilities. <clears throat> Now we get into our wonderful friend reset windup. Anytime we have multiple devices, and we've seen this in uh, cascade control, uh, also where we have uh, multiple uh, controllers, whenever we have one controller that's doing a majority of the work or one of them is in manual and the other one is in auto, uh, and there's potential of um, having to switch from manual to auto or from one device to another device, we, we hopefully have learned the importance of um, making sure that the unselected device is in the game, meaning that it knows where the selected device is at in terms of uh, control signal, so that when we switch to the non-selected controller, we, we don't get a bump, right? We talked about bumpless transfer. Um, that's the result of not being on the same page. Um, the magnitude of how big that bump could be is a result of what we call reset windup. <clears throat> so reset windup we learned earlier uh, in process is a situation that occurs when the non-selected controller is in automatic and is trying to respond to the error created by the selected controller. So it's there waiting to do its work, pretending to do its job, um, but the other controller is actually doing the job right now. Because the non-selected controller is always seeing the error, it's reading the process the same way as the selected one, but it can't change its values because it's not selected. Its integrating nature is going to start to saturate the controller's bias setting. And remember, we saw where it does the set point uh, process variable um, comparison and sees the error, then applies the PID settings to it, and the controller output goes up, 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 up to 100%, and then it keeps saturating uh, past 100%, uh, and we call that value the reset windup value, and it'll continue to do that until it can get some kind of feedback telling it to go the other way. So it, it's very bad because that reset windup is above and beyond the 100% range of our normal operating system. So if that controller were to fail, the operating one were to fail at that point in time, and the change would be made to the non-selected controller, it's gonna be showing an error um, that is magnitudes times worse than it actually is. And you'll get a serious process swing, possibly, possibly also damage or injury. So to eliminate reset windup, the solution is pretty simple. We use something called external feedback. Again, we've talked about this before, where the signal from the selected controller or the one that's currently working is sent to the bias of the non-selected controller, which means that we're just, I'm doing the work, I'm putting out as I should, but I'm keeping you on the same page so you know where I am. If I should suddenly pass out and you have to take, take over, we're going to be working at the same output. So as a result, then we're not going to have this bump. So we have what we call bumpless transfer if that failure were to occur. The feedback that we give in terms of this external feedback can either be pneumatic or digital, depending on the controller. And of course, we have to look at, at both of them. So here's what it looks like. It is very, very simple. When you look at it here pneumatically, I have this controller, I have this controller, I have a low selector, and it is doing 
uh, taking a process measurement. I'm using, let's say, the pressure controller is the low, run, low one right now. It sends a signal to the selector. The selector selects that signal and is going to send that signal out to the valve. That's the way we normally would have seen it. That's what the process is. But with external feedback, that's this line here and this line here, you can see that the output from the selector is going to this hub. It's going to the control element. It's going to the non-selected controller. So let's say it's putting out 50%, the valve's half, half open. It's sending the feedback signal back to the selected controller at 50%. It's sending the control uh, signal to the non-selected controller back at 50%. So if I were suddenly to switch this over to the other side, it's comparing this number the same way that this one is comparing this number. So we don't get pumpless, I mean, we don't get reset wind up because it's comparing the same error values and we don't get bumpless transfer. Okay, so again, the external feedback or reset tieback is used to prevent reset wind up. It prevents the non selected controller's output from becoming saturated. It does this by setting its bias setting equal to the signal that is going to the output of the selected controller so that even though it's not technically doing any work it is responding to the same signals as the device that is doing the work okay let's uh address some certain circumstances when you will have situations that you're going to have discrepancies between the two devices one of those applications or one of those times that that's going to happen is when you're in manual operation sometimes during startup for example um, you're going to have to run in manual, and this works pretty good for selective and override control. When in manual, the selector is going to send status to the two controllers, so both of these controllers here, and they will go into initialized manual mode. Remember, we put it into manual mode. It loses all of its computing power, basically, is the way it works. Their outputs are going to both be set to the manual output value, whatever the operator happens to put it to, uh, for bumpless transfer when switched into auto. So whatever the output here on the controller is, based on the operator's manual output value that's going to the valve, is also going to be sent to both of the controllers. They can both be in manual. They're going to be trying to uh, trying to control, but they can't, but they're going to be controlling the same variable, the measured variable and the output of the controller in order to get the error. So that when we do put them into mat op, uh, sorry, when we do switch them over into auto, there's not going to be any bump. So reset tieback, external feedback, eliminating bumpless transfer. That's the whole point there. Okay, tuning here. So each loop of the system must be tuned separately. There's no way to tune them together because they don't operate together. So in order to remove one of them from the mix, all we got to do is put it in manual and set its output higher than the other one. Okay, so that it doesn't end up getting selected uh, inadvertently. We want to tune it around the normal set point for that controller. And then when we put it back in service, make sure that the output is near of that needed to achieve the current PV or there will be a bump. So you just got to make sure what your process variable currently is. And if you need to adjust your uh, manual output in order to get it closer when you switch it to auto so you don't get that bump. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so how do you configure one of these things? How do you know if it's going to be high select or low select or median select and all that kind of stuff? Um, there's a process to do it, and there used to be more exercises in the ILM uh, on this procedure. Um, I've left them in the PowerPoint at the end. I'm not going to talk about them too much again, um, but this is the process that we have to go through. So to design the procedure for override, uh, selective control, for example, which is one of the most common ones and the only one that you really got to think about too much. Um, 
is, is this process here. So first, you got to determine the fault or the safety condition. And I'll, I'll give you an example here in a second. So it's going to be like, what happens if I have too high a line pressure or too low a suction pressure, that type of thing. Uh, and we'll do some examples. Then we have to determine the valve action to satisfy each one of the faults. And so that means, okay, well, if I get high pressure, what do I have to do? Open the valve or close the valve? Uh, if I get low flow, do I have to open the valve or close the valve? Once we identify uh, our conditions, then we have to uh, identify that safety action. And it has to be the same for both because there's only one way that the valve can fail. Okay, then we determine the valve fail position. Hopefully that'll work out for us. Then we determine the action for each controller. So we can we can change the action of controllers, direct acting or reverse acting, and we'll look at the process. And then finally, we determine the relay selector after that. I don't believe there's a requirement anymore in the ILM for you to actually do this. Let me just quickly have a look here. Um, but we used to do it, and I did leave a couple of examples uh, in the PowerPoint here so you can get some practice if you wanted to try it. Um, you may see one of these on a test still, wink, wink. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the example and walk through those five steps. Okay, so here I have a pump uh, discharge line that's got a flow transmitter and a pressure transmitter on it. And our potential problems here, uh, let's say this is a pipeline, my potential problems are that I have uh, an open line, uh, a pipeline rupture, for example, or a pinch line, someone ran over it with a track hole. So what are my problems, what are my problems going to be? That's the first thing. So identify the fault conditions and valve action. So an open line is going to cause an increase in flow. Therefore, we're going to need to close the valve in order to restrict the flow. Okay, that's how we handle that condition. The second condition is a pinch line will cause an incre increase in line pressure. Therefore, we need to close the valve in order to decrease the pressure. So close the valve, close the valve. Is the valve action the same? Yes. Okay, so that's important. They both match. So what do we need the fail action to be in this system? Well, they both need to close, so fail closed in order to protect against uh, leaks. So then we have to determine, determine the controller action. The flow controller is going to be reverse acting. So if we have uh, an open line, the increase in flow, increased signal going into the controller. This is a fail closed valve. So with an increasing signal, it's going to open. So we don't want that. We don't want the increasing signal to open it more. We want the increasing signal to close it. Therefore, this controller has to be reverse acting. The pressure controller needs to be reverse acting so that an increase in pressure will close the valve. Again, uh, with this one here, the pressure on a pinched line is going to be increasing. So increasing signal coming in has to be a decreasing signal coming out. So it has to be reverse action. Then we will determine the relay action. So flow above the normal set point, we need the output of the flow controller to decrease. If the pressure is too high, we need the output of the pressure controller to decrease. So therefore, we need a low selector relay in order to satisfy our safety and operating conditions. So that's the process uh, to go through it. Um, you don't have these examples anymore in the ILM, so I wouldn't put too much uh, time into looking at the following examples. Um, again, as I said, 90% of the applications that we look at are going to be a low select application. And as you look through these examples, uh, you'll see that most of the um, most of the examples are going to be low select, with the exception of that reactor temperature one. So here's another one, uh, high flow rate, low suction rate. So what do we want to do if we have high flow, we want to close the valve. Uh, if we have low pressure, we want to have the valve, this valve uh, also closed so we get better suction pressure. So that's the same, cool. So fail, close valve, that's correct. And then we determine an increase in, increase in uh, flow. We need to decrease the controller output in order to close the valve. So again, if this is increasing that signal is increasing we need this to go down so reverse acting decreasing in pressure on this side 
needs a decre decrease in the controller output in order to close the valve. So this one is going to be direct acting. And flow above normal, we need the flow controller to decrease. That's going to allow the valve to close. And pressure below normal, we need the pressure controller to decrease. That's going to allow the valve to close also. So we're going to pick a low select, the lower of the two signals. So I'm not going to go through the next one, but that's how it works. Last but not least, the block diagram for selective control. So here's an override control strategy. We have a normal transmitter. We have an override transmitter here. We have our low selector, and it is simply selecting between the uh, two different measurement signals here and providing that to our output. Uh, oddly enough, they don't show the reset time back. So there's block diagram. That, my friends, is the end of the entire process section. Congratulations.